and mute myself and shut my video down and turn it over to Nicola. Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us for this SUNY Remote Teaching Institute session today on um, teaching remotely in the creative and performing arts. Um, my name is Nicola Mariala. I'm the Dean of uh, the School of the Arts and Humanities at SUNY Empire State College. And I have been teaching online, digitally, or remotely in some way or another in the arts since the 90s. I was a very early adopter and pioneer in learning and emerging technologies. Um, in a previous role, I was actually the director of the dance program um, and a dancer choreographer, um, as well as directing instructional technology for a university in Texas, um, where I worked previously. And I've been with Empire State College for 18 years now, um, and working in a wide range of roles, um, including, of course, the faculty role prior to being dean, um, in which I have taught um, and designed all kinds of different learning opportunities in the arts, um, from everything from studio-based classes face-to-face -face through to fully online and all the variations in between. So I do hope that um, some of the tips and tricks I have to share, some of the pedagogy and strategies are applicable to what you're facing today. Before we begin delving into um, approaching remote teaching, let's just talk about good practices for teaching in general. Um, Arthur Chickering was actually the first vice provost, sorry, vice president academic and provost at SUNY Empire State College. And in the late 80s, he and a group of um, college leaders from the Northeast got together. And they all represented different types of institutions, different types of learning, different types of students. And they got together and came to agreement on what they felt were the seven principles for good practice in undergraduate education. These were not designed for online learning, but later, once online learning became a thing, um, these became adopted as this, the gold standard for online learning. However, these principles apply to any modality in which you're working with undergraduate students. And frankly, with some modification, work just as well for graduate students. So the first, the first encourage contact between students and faculty is even more possible since the advent of online and social media. Um, students not only connect with their faculty members and the professors um, online, um, but also in the classroom and in office hours, and they can use email in a myriad of other ways to communicate. Um, but the key element is really just making sure you're in touch with your students in whatever ways are appropriate for your teaching. Um, the second is develop reciprocity and cooperation among students. And that ties in very much to peer-to-peer -peer learning in which you encourage your students to work together. And of course, all of us know that in the arts, that is one of the foundations of arts-based pedagogy. Our students collaborate, they create art together, and even if they're working in um, solo endeavors, such as working on a painting, in a classroom setting or a studio-based setting, there is usually peer-to-peer -peer critique going on and sort of shared collaboration and encouragement um, related to the development of each person's individual artwork. Um, of course, active learning is also a hallmark of arts-based pedagogies. Um, I'm sure that all of you apply active learning in your classrooms, so I don't need to explain that here. Um, very critical is this idea of prompt feedback, which is truly important to student satisfaction and their learning. Um, I think that in the classroom, you probably do that automatically. You provide critique, you provide, um, you know, corrections if it's a dance class, um, and, um, you know, you, you give continuous ongoing formative feedback to your students as they move along through the artistic process. That is just as important online. And part of what we'll talk about is what strategies do you use moving forward to do this. The next piece is emphasizing time on task. Now, in a nutshell, this basically means make sure people know what they need to be doing, 
how much time they'll be spending on it and remind them of what they need to be doing, what is due, what's due next, and how they need to approach um, successfully completing their, their work. Um, and this is something that student satisfaction also notes um, that students who are reminded of and feel that the instructor is paying attention to what they need to be doing and helping them along with that, um, you know, have, you know, express, express strong satisfaction with that. The other piece, of course, and I am sure that this is ubiquitous across the arts, communicating high expectations and respecting diverse talents and ways of learning. All of these have become essential aspects of effective learning across modes since the 20th century and into the 21st century and continue to be so. And I just want to lay down these foundations as we move into talking about what it means to adapt this to remote teaching if you are applying these in classroom settings. Now, some of you may or may not have heard about universal design. So I'm going to give you a brief nutshell um, description of what that entails. I had the good fortune of working for George Covington, who um, was at the time very much involved in the initial uh, writing about universal design and co-authored one of the first books. And George used to summarize it as such, you know, universal design is when, regardless of age from nine to 99, um, most people can use whatever it may be or enter the environment as it is, um, most of the time, and that some people might need modifications. Now, what you have to keep in mind when you're thinking about universal design of learning, and that's whether it applies in a physical classroom, whether it's online or a hybrid, you want to think about equitable use. Equity is going to be important when you think about working with your students remotely. They will probably not have equal access to the space, the tools, the internet connectivity, and privacy, perhaps, all the things that they might need to be successful in studying and doing the assignments in your course and participating. Um, flexibility and use, and we'll talk a little bit about flexibility as we go forward, but how are you going to handle, for example, if somebody has tech issues when it's your time for your remote session and they're unable to attend? if they have to miss a rehearsal that's a digital rehearsal that was synchronously scheduled. You probably want to be more flexible about these situations than you would be in face-to-face. -face. Because face-to-face, -face, certainly, yes, people can have problems um, getting somewhere or they can be a bit late because they were delayed. Maybe the subway was late or something like that. But we all know internet connectivity issues, um, tech failure, having problems getting into Zoom or to Microsoft Teams or Blackboard Collaborate or whatever tool you use, those are fairly frequent and they're not within the control of the student. So you probably want to think about the flexibility, like how do you set policies that work well for your students? I'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. Ideally, keep it simple, keep it intuitive, um, make sure that the information is perceptible and clear um, and very important for when you're teaching remotely. Keep in mind tolerance for error. Try to keep the efforts low for the student. Tolerance for error ties into this flexibility idea. For example, if you have a student who is not digitally savvy, they will not be as equitable in preparation as someone who's super digitally savvy and has access to all the digital devices. So the question is, are you going to judge their learning by the same criteria? Or are you going to start understanding as you're working with them that some people will not be coming in at the same level technically and digitally and that you may have to help facilitate their path, their path a little bit further and start thinking about what kinds of things truly meet the learning goals that you're working with and what kinds of things that are problematic for the student are not necessary to meeting that learning goal. And of course, size and space for approach and use. That is true of any space, like what size of studio do you need? What size of theater do you need? What size of, um, you know, a facility is required to fulfill what you're trying to do with your students? So the same thing is going to apply in virtual classrooms. Like how many students do you have? Do you need to work with them all, like with, with you um, speaking out to everyone? Or are you going to be breaking them into small groups? Do you have a TA available? If you have a TA, is that TA doing separate sessions for different groups? 
Is that TA working in your space with you and um, having breakout groups and guiding separate sections? So these are the kinds of things that you want to be thinking about as you move in to thinking about delivering your remote instruction for the arts. Um, I want to touch briefly on what is known as the community of inquiry, um, a group of Canadian scholars, um, Garrison um, and Anderson, um, presented this um, in, the, in, in, in around 2000. Um, now, the idea is that you want to have social presence, cognitive presence, and teaching presence in the course. The teaching presence being that you provide the instruction, or your TAs are providing the instruction, however that works within your model. Um, social presence is the entire setting of the presences in the course that come from the tone that you set, from how you engage the students together so they get to know each other. This automatically happens in a studio setting or a class setting, especially in arts-based studio courses. But it isn't necessarily automatic in another educational mode unless you take the efforts to make sure people have the opportunity to get to know each other, whether it's in an online discussion forum, whether you have a round table to open the course in which everyone talks a little bit about themselves, but you want to think about building in those opportunities, even when you're teaching remotely, because you have to think, how do you replace those hallway conversations that would happen? Or one student helping another at the bar, or someone else in a theater class giving a colleague some tips. These are all things that you want to be able to build in. And the cognitive presence is, of course, that mental presence, that, that, that presence um, of availability to learning and the connection of all of the learning resources you'll provide, whatever they may be, whether they're reading video, other resources, or your own demonstrations, etc. Now, Marty Cleveland Innes is a wonderful Canadian scholar who added a fourth presence that's not here on this model. This is the original model. Um, she added emotional presence. And I think that it's important when you move forward into teaching remotely to understand that both you and your students will probably feel very vulnerable in this space. And that there's often a lot of anxiety, performance anxiety connected to, um, you know, to be suddenly open, vulnerable, and in this space digitally. You will probably want to make sure that you set a really wonderful tone, that you create a safe space for the work in the way that you would set a wonderful tone in your dance studio or in your theater or in the art studio for working with your students. You want to find a way to make sure people feel welcomed and that they understand that it's okay if they make mistakes in the beginning, that it's okay if they're, if they're struggling digitally at first, that you'll all work through this together. And so these three presences are critical Um, presences moving forward. And I see in the chat, I stopped for a second because I see the request for the citations and I do have that. And at the end, I'll be sure to give you all of the citations and you could, you will receive as well this, um, this PowerPoint if you're interested and all of the references and all of the links are present on each of the notes pages for these. Now, the next framework I want to look at before we go talking specifically about, um, you know, strategies for arts-based teaching and the considerations that you may have is the TPAC framework. This has become more and more adapted since it emerged in, you know, the 2000s because it touches upon something that originally wasn't, was tacitly understood, but not necessarily brought to the surface in what happens when you're teaching with technology. And, when, and in this case, if you're teaching remotely, this applies. When you're teaching in a new environment digitally, you're combining technological knowledge with pedagogical knowledge and content knowledge. If you're used to only teaching face-to-face, -face, then you will probably want to brush up on some of the pedagogical knowledge that connects to teaching with technology and, and, and align that with your content knowledge, which is the way that you usually teach. And I'm sure that all of you are effective in arts-based pedagogies, in, 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 in teaching appropriately for the pedagogy of your fields. Um, 
However, there's that additional level of pedagogical knowledge that comes in, you know, understanding social constructivism, understanding constructionism, perhaps understanding meta literacy and how that works. And these are all different levels of pedagogical knowledge that truly help inform what it is that you're going to be doing as you work in these remote um, environments. I don't have time to go in depth into any of these. But certainly, if you have questions at the end, I can I can point to some. I often give presentations in, in which I focus primarily on the pedagogical methods applied, but and and the various um, educational theories that connect to these. But time just hasn't allowed for me to be able to cover that today. Before we go further to talk about teaching remotely, I want to talk a little bit about the theory of the online disinhibition effect. Now, John Suler is the psychologist that wrote about this um, in the 90s. So this has been around as early as the 90s when everyone started jumping into using the internet. And he has a free and openly available resource called The Psychology of Cyberspace. And in that, um, the first few paragraphs of his work summarize um, what, what he means. But I just want to give you the nutshell idea of what is the online disinhibition effect. You've probably seen this. Um, in social media, and we certainly see this today. But what happens is that often people act differently in online environments or when communicating through digital media than they do face to face. So that person who's very quiet sitting in a meeting may actually be quite uh, loquacious using social media and be very active in making their opinion heard. Um, the extreme of this is when people start becoming much more um, assertive and aggressive um, verbally and in written form or even using um, YouTube and other social media online, which happens. Um, you know, one of the example that Suler gives is the idea of, is, is that alcohol disinhibits and that some people when they drink alcohol become much friendlier and more open and some people when they drink a lot of alcohol cannot handle it and become angry and they change personalities a little bit. So this, the idea is that online, in cyberspace, this happens. You want to be aware of the fact that this can happen in your courses. You want to be thinking about strategies of how do you handle that student who seemed very friendly and very open and even perhaps quiet with their colleagues in the classroom face to face, but who is actually much more assertive and perhaps even verbally aggressive online. So, you know, you want to think about measures for that. And there are all kinds of tips on, you know, online etiquette for students and for learners and online rules and parameters you can set that you'll find in various, um, if you, you know, if you do a Google search for that. Um, one good thing about disinhibition is that it's not just a negative effect. I mean, for some people, and part of the research shows that let's say in games like World of Warcraft or other um, totally immersive multiplayer games, um, many people who would normally not be as outgoing with their neighbors in the real world are actually very friendly and outgoing to newcomers. And we'll share with them, we'll introduce themselves to them, and we'll welcome them to come join them. Um, and we'll provide them with some resources that are perhaps not available to a newcomer, but that would really help them get along in the game. Um, so disinhibition happens, it happens both sides, negative and positive. And you may or may not have heard about Zoom bombing, which has been a recent thing, which is why they're changing um, you know, the security settings of Zoom. And that is that, as soon as educators all went online at the same time, um, some people thought it would be very fun to drop in illegally to these meetings and start um, putting, for example, either pornography or hateful statements or other things into the chat room. And that would be visible to everyone, all of the students involved. And there's security measures um, now to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, but it has happened and it and it is likely to happen unless you're very careful about designing and making secure the learning environment that you're providing and being prepared to deal with this sort of thing should it happen. Now, overall, oops, sorry, this moved time. Um, when you're working with digital learning, there are a few strategies that have proven to be very effective. And this is regardless of whether it's a temporary, um, you're going remotely for your class because you have to, or whether you're thinking about implementing, you know, blended courses or online courses. 
The first is work with active and authentic assessment, um, ideally applied learning. Now, of course, that was mentioned before in the seven principles, um, but is also very effective in digital learning. And of course, for arts-based learning, this is generally the rule as opposed to the exception. So I'm going to suppose that you mostly have active authentic assessments in your classes anyway, and that what you'll want to think about is how do you take those and apply them digitally. One strategy I use in my courses is I promote learner autonomy. I let them make a lot of choices about what they're going to do, what tools they'll use, how they're going to use it, what topic they want to focus on, what kind of project they want to do, how they want to demonstrate the learning. Because when I do that, then the onus is on the student to go figure out which tool, to learn the tool, and to choose a topic that's meaningful and relevant to them. When they do it this way, for example, the art students that decides that they're going to do a 3D display of sculpture using an immersive environment, which is a lot of work, then if they choose the tools, they, cho they chose to do this project, which would be challenging, they, ch they choose their own tools, they do their own learning, then what happens is that they are perfectly happy to work through the challenges that they'll be dealing with to get to that learning outcome that they themselves wanted to do. As opposed to having you, let's say, determine that it must be a certain tool that they use in a certain way on a certain topic in which students may not be as happy to spend a lot of time working through challenges on tools on something that wasn't necessarily their choice. So I encourage as much as possible to provide either a few selections or have open selection for students on tools when possible. Of course, if you use Isadora and Isadora is the only option and the best option and that's what you teach and that's what the course is about, then they have to learn Isadora. I mean, the same thing will go for logic if they're working on music and recording and logic is the tool you're using, then that's the one they'll have to learn and that's why they're in the course. And again, digital art and design, you know, the Adobe Creative Suite, that's what you're working with, that's what they'll have to learn. But there are many other uh, scenarios in which a choice of apps and tools um, is very appropriate for the student and for the learning in the course. Um, smartphones are amazing, they are mini computers, they have video, they have all kinds of apps. Most students can do most learning using those for the arts. Um, unless, of course, they're getting to very highly specialized digital editing that requires high-end um, high machinery or high-end 3D immersive development, again, that requires high-end machines to work with it. But for the majority of applications, their smartphone will work just fine. Um, I encourage your students to learn on their own and to learn to learn to find that video tutorial. YouTube is full of them, they're amazing. Um, look up how to's, work with what used to be called lynda.com that has these fantastic, well-designed um, tutorials um, is, and is now called LinkedIn Learning. And there are many other ways of finding arts-specific learning online. Um, encourage them to experiment and to learn from this experimentation. And again, this goes back to the allowing for failure, allowing for flexibility um, and, and understanding that things can get challenging in the digital environment and sometimes you work with a tool that won't do what you thought it would do or that you can't accomplish your goal with it and therefore you either have to drop that or then do a whole other set of learning that goes with it so when you're working with your students and you're working in this remote environment just keep that in mind for you for yourself and your own teaching and for your students you can do experimentation but then also be flexible with the assessment of students, be flexible in how you approach things if that's the case. And then promote peer-to-peer -peer instruction and feedback. The ZPD is the zone of proximal development that emerged from uh, Vygotsky's theory in mind and society on the fact that there's a zone around us in which there's what we can learn by ourselves that has a certain limit. And then there's what we learn from instruction by, uh, let's say, a faculty member, and from learning through our peers. And that has developed in educational theory into something called the ZPD, and there's a whole wide range of research on how that works. It works really well in remote instruction environments, this idea of having peers help each other learn. Um, and if you have questions about that, we can talk a little bit about that. And we'll be getting to dance in just a second. All right, next thing, virtual community engagement. Virtual community is a whole other field. 
it has a wide range of emergent research and well-established research and some people who've been doing longitudinal studies in this area. Um, it started long before the internet, um, but I don't have time to get into this idea of, you know, sort of giving the inception, that's a whole other presentation on the history of virtual communities and how they have evolved and how you're successful in virtual community development. If you're going to be teaching remotely and you're in the classroom, essentially, this is a virtual community. And there are some keys for appropriate engagement in this virtual community. So I'm just going to throw out there a few things. I won't dwell on these because you can read, you can see the slide. But the basic thing is really make it meaningful. Be intentional about your interactions. How will your students interact when in this space? At what points will they interact? Have you designed the interactions in there? Because if you're planning breakout rooms, they need to know they're going to be going to the breakout rooms. They need to be very clearly be told this is how it's going to work. They need to have those breakout rooms set up so that you can connect them when appropriate. And then need to know when to come back in to the classroom. They need to know what they're doing in that breakout room if you don't have a TA to be guiding them or if you're not available because you're, in, you're moving from breakout room room to break up room working with all the students. So you really just have to be thinking about that. Think about the interactions, how they're going to be designed, whether they're mandatory or optional. Um, you know, set your rules of engagement. And you have to be an active moderator, going back to the whole disinhibition um, that we talked about. Um, or you have to assign students as lead moderators, however you want to do that. Um, I would encourage you as much as possible to do all of this up front. Don't do it on the fly. I know that in the classroom, a lot of things can be done while you're there. You can say, let's all work this out together. You come to class and you can work that out. That is not as easy to do on the fly in a remote environment and setting. So I would recommend that you carefully pre-plan when interactions are going to happen and how and by whom, and then set all of that up as you know, in your syllabus or as close as possible to the opening of um, the course at the semester's beginning and don't plan on doing this as you go. Um, one thing that does not work well in teaching remotely is doing things as you go as opposed to really thinking things through and having it planned out and making those plans clear to students as the course is starting. All right. Considerations for the performing arts. Um, first you want of to just all, pause a sec, uh, Nicole. There was just like two questions because you, I know there were a couple of questions about dance, which I'm sure you're going to get to now. Um, but uh, there were two questions I thought maybe we shouldn't leave behind. Uh, so um, Eleanor asks your thoughts on think tanks with application engineers, instructional designers, and faculty to produce computer devices and apps programs. Uh -huh. Oh, suitable to dance movement instruction. So it's a dance question as well. So maybe we'll hold off on that. But Marjorie asked um, about um, you know, using PowerPoint. She had to use PowerPoint as a booklet layout solution that worked well, but is this use dumbing us down uh, uh, related to Adobe? Do you think the online design needs changing become more open source, et cetera? So I guess, you know, I guess the question is about, you know, how um, your thoughts about kind of, you know, how do we make the, the, the technology, you know, not limit us and, and try to, you know, uh, how do we, how do we kind of use what we have, but also not sort of be constrained by it? It's a big question, but I'm sure it's a big question. Thoughts. So if you want to tackle that first, I could certainly um, jump into tackling that. First of all, I personally am not fond of PowerPoints, and I don't think you'll find a single PowerPoint in any of my classes. I mean, I'm using a PowerPoint here because this way there's something that you can have as a takeaway. You can see as I'm talking because I'm going through very quickly. It is not my favorite mode of sharing information. I personally am highly digitally um, skilled. Um, I design and teach at the graduate level how to create 3D immersive virtual learning environments. So I actually teach a lot of the creative arts within virtual immersive environments that are full 3D simulations of what can be done in real time in real space. And um, so there are tools out there that can allow you to do that. Um, in order to do that, you'll have a learning curve, right? I mean, for me, I started working in those immersive environments before 2000. 
And so I have a facility with that that has been longitudinal. It developed over time and working with lots of tools, settings, and collaborations um, and doing a lot of learning. So, but there are fantastic tools that will allow you to get in there and do all kinds of things. You know, and I reference, let's say, Isadora. I have a colleague who teaches at a distance using Isadora um, and using a, no a number of other really advanced digital media tools for the arts. She is also teaching in the Masters of Arts and Learning and Emerging Technologies, the graduate program I reference. So has deep expertise um, and that has been developed longitudinally as well. So some of those kinds of things, they can be done, but they take collaboration with someone who really knows how to use these tools and to help work with you. Um, but on the other hand, there are lots and lots of other approaches and apps and ways of doing things that have been developing. Um, and you really just have to apply that creativity that you apply in your art to the creativity of thinking about what do I need to do to teach this effectively in a remote environment. Part of what you need to think about is, you know, always focus on the end goal. What are the learning outcomes the student is expected to demonstrate? What I want them to really know and show that they know. What I want them to do and show that they can do. Those, that's where you should start. And then from there, go, wait a minute, did they really need to do this X, Y, Z I've been having them doing? Does that get them to that? And if it doesn't, change what you're doing so that you can have the time and the space to bring in more of the kinds of experimentation and the working with tools that might help them to get to that. Um, but there are, I didn't want to make this about tools, but there are a whole wide range of tools out there specific to each discipline. Um, now for dance, if you, you know, you might want to take a look at danceo.com and the other places, let's say, that are teaching dance classes, dance technique at a distance and that are teaching them remotely and that are doing them effectively. And think about how might you do that. There are lots of people who figured out on YouTube, um, high end, you know, a couple of New York City for, uh, ballet dancers um, who teach um, technique classes um, in digital environments and they're very successful about doing that. Um, so you probably want to be looking at um, what it is you actually want to accomplish and then think about the different ways that you could do this. I would recommend that if you're new to this and you're thinking that you want to do certain things creatively, but you don't have the digital skills or knowledge, then you'll most likely need to collaborate with an educational technologist, with um, an instructional designer, and ideally with a colleague in your field who has that particular expertise that you're looking for and they, where you can collaborate together to create something. Um, and, I, and I think that in this scenario where so many of you are having to very quickly move remotely, I do think that at first you probably want to start with what's feasible in the short term. And then and, 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 and take out anything additional, things that you would love to do, love to have, but they're not possible right away. And then as you build up your skills, as you build your networks, and as you learn more about the tools and who's available to help you with them, then you could start moving into doing further things. Um, there is an organization in the UK call, called Digital Theatre Plus. They provide a whole wide range of uh, really sophisticated resources for teaching theatre and dance and, um, and other performing arts um, at a distance and remotely. The downside of that is that they do have a subscription which is, which is institutional and pretty hefty. But you might want to take a look at what they have and look at what they do to give you ideas about how you might approach something like that. Um, well, you yes. had mentioned a, a, a website address with something like dance.com. I didn't catch it either. A couple of people I'm sorry. What that um, was. All that, that's coming up. I actually okay. have right. that in the slide that's coming up. It's, okay, a, it's like right on the slide. Okay. Um, because a couple of these, I actually have a page on coming next on dance, teaching dance remotely. Um, but, uh, but I'll answer those couple of questions. You know, now, now having... I mean, my thoughts on having sort of a think tank or a group of a group of experts working to collaborate with faculty to create devices and apps and programs suitable to dance movement instruction. I mean, I think, of course, that would be wonderful. Um, I have a colleague, Kathleen Ruiz, who works, in, you know, she does incredible work at RPI. Um, and they do incredible innovative work in immersive, digital, avant-garde, experimental uh, ways of teaching um, dance and movement and, uh, and developing 
very innovative games. Um, and they've done all kinds of things, including body capture, motion capture, using real life figures, but in which then they projected into 3D to create the dance program. Um, so there are people out there who have deep expertise in these areas. And there are some universities, although only a few that really have the small programs with the resources, such as the ones that RPI has, um, but working on this. So again, the key is to really start, start with where you, you are. And then as you build towards that, start looking at the networks to find out where could you network and who has access to even at the beginning stages this type of technology these kinds of resources and this capability it's growing there wasn't a whole lot of it 10 years ago there's much more of it now and this continues to grow i suspect that five years from now we'll see a tremendous amount of resources in this area post covid right what's happened what happens to performing arts teaching post 2020 i'm sure we'll see some pretty radical um, changes coming um, so I'll, in, in, in the spirit of time, I'll, I'll speak a little bit to these um, points that I have here, and then I'll move on to the next slides, because most of the next slides are related to the kinds of questions you're asking, which are really about sort of the resources and the strategies that are specific to certain disciplines. Um, now, when you're thinking about your remote teaching, these are a few things that we have learned from my colleagues who teach the, in the performing arts at SUNY Empire State College. They've been wonderful pioneers in working in this remote learning instruction. Um, colleagues all across SUNY who've participated in a number of these types of webinars and who have been asking questions and proposing solution. I mean, I've already talked about the idea that you need to think about the learning goals and make sure that at this point in this preliminary phase, make sure you have the learning goal in mind and remove anything that's ancillary and find creative ways to get students to those learning goals and be flexible on how you get to those learning goals with them. Um, and to be, to be more specific, so if, if it's a dance student, they need to learn technique. Is it that they have to learn your technique and that you have to be demonstrating it? Then that's a whole set of things that you have to do. If it is that they have to learn, I don't know, limon technique, and there's somebody who already has a whole series of video studio classes that teach very similar technique to what you would like for them to learn, then maybe that would be appropriate for them to do instead of you having to do the, the technique classes yourself. Um, is it that they don't even need to have to learn a specific technique? Is it that you just want them to stay in, in, in technique shape for that semester um, until they can get back to the regular face-to-face -face classroom and then move in, you know, continue in the program? In that case, there may be a wide range of technique classes of different styles that might be appropriate. So you have to think about, you know, is it your specific technique? Is it a specific technique that someone teaches perfectly well digitally and that you can use that series that they offer? Is it a wide range of techniques, in which case there are a wide range offered digitally that the students could take those classes? Some of them are free, some of them are for a fee. So you want to be thinking about that approach. And that, this applies for theater, it applies for everything. There are lots of online classes about acting for example, and other aspects of filmmaking and teaching drawing online and how to paint, I mean, all of those things. So what you have to think about is do any of these serve your purpose or do you need to use some of those and then create uniquely the things that are particular to your teaching? And if that's the case, spend the time creating those and for the things that are available offered by someone else, then use those as well. It will save you a lot of time and effort. Um, another consideration is space. I'm lucky at home, I have my dance studio. Normally I actually would be broadcasting from the dance studio, but unfortunately my internet's not working at home today. So I came to my son's house and so here I am. Um, but spaces, does a student have a space to move or are they in a small Brooklyn apartment with four roommates or family members in which they can't really use much space? How do they approach doing the work? So you have to think about making sure that you adapt the expectations to the space they will use or that they'll have access to based on what they have in their homes um, at this point for the remote instruction. And um, lots of people have come up with very creative ways of approaching that. Um, also privacy considerations. If students are working in sort of a vulnerable space, maybe they're doing some improv, a dance improv. Uh, we've seen incidents in which students really, whatever they had to do, they were surrounded by family members. It was difficult for them to have privacy. So thinking about that colleague who suggested have them if it if it doesn't require intensive movement maybe they can have privacy going into the bathroom if they're on, if there's only a small space in the small house available um, so think about those things and we've talked about collaboration critiques and corrections you can do them just as well um, 
online, peer-to-peer -peer critique. I personally use a number of rubrics with my students. Every class I teach has peer-to-peer -peer critique. It works very well remotely, just as well as it can work face-to-face. Um, -face. Students just need to have the right parameters and guidelines provided ahead of time. Um, and again, be adaptive. Think about the feasibility. Work your way through the technical considerations for each scenario you're considering. Use available resources first, and then also consider digital resource costs. In other words, if they took that Dancio series, I don't know how much it would cost. So let's say it's cost $40 a month. You could consider that to be the equivalent of what they would pay for a textbook so that it would be an equivalent cost for taking the course and require that the student take that. In the same way that if someone's taking digital art and design advanced, they are required to subscribe to the Adobe Creative Suite for that period of time for that semester in which they're taking digital art and design advanced. It is a requirement for the course and it replaces a textbook. So think about how you will approach those digital resources. Um, many of you have wondered, and I wanted to make sure I put this slide up this time because I used it once and then I didn't bring it to the second session. I talked about something else and people were asking questions about this sort of thing. If you go to Amazon and you look up smartphone tripod, there are all kinds of streaming packets available depending on what it is you want to do. Now this packet is no longer available at this price in the way it was. I took this screenshot about three months ago, but they now, because there's been such a high demand, they have a whole wide range of different packets available depending on what you want. But this is a very basic one, a tripod to put a smartphone. It comes with lighting and the lavalier mic. Just what most people need to be able to do streaming, whether they're moving and dancing or whether they're doing a talking head type thing. So you will find these packets, these little packages, these kits that you can get somewhere like Amazon, just as you might require the Dancio sessions or some equivalent that have a subscription fee. You could also say to the students, you will be expected to get the following kit and you could put you know, whatever kit it is, um, you can make it very specific or you could say, I don't, you know, you could say that you don't really care which brands you're getting, but that you want them to have a this to that and a this, and you lay out the tools that you want them to have to be able to be successful with the course. Um, in reality, most, most students for most things really just need a good smartphone. Um, they have incredible computing capacity, incredible video and camera capacity nowadays. Um, and those little 10 to $15 tripods really make a difference. Um, so just think about those kinds of things, like what kinds of things would really help your students successfully record and share, whether it's for live streaming or that they're sharing their project with you in video, because you might require some things live, you might require some things just recorded. Um, here we are at the, I'm sorry, that skipped over very quickly. We, we are on the dance pedagogy resources. So um, for, um, I think it's Eleanor and the people who are asking all the questions about dance. Dance Studies Association has an incredible resource page. It will, it will answer most of your questions. Here's the link to danceo.com. $15.99 per month is their current rate. Um, and there's an excellent, oops, sorry, that skipped over. There's an excellent um, document on considerations for moving classes online, dance classes online, written by Heather Castillo and Mary Park, and I put the link there. So I think that from these resources, you will probably have most of your questions answered. It goes from everything very basic to the much more advanced approaches people may want to use. And then here, I will stop here for questions. I just want to put the list. Um, I have a number of links that you may have seen before and that you may see um, throughout this teaching institute that you're joining, but that lists a, a range of resources for you. Um, the Gallatin Arts Workshop um, Distance Learning Tips are excellent, and they cover everything in the creative arts, like if you're teaching in the visual arts, if you're teaching in theater, if you're teaching in film and media arts, and so on. So you will find, I think, that, that document to be very helpful. And there's an excellent document on the shift of what happens when you teach theater online. So I will stop there. We have a few minutes and I will um, take questions. So would anybody like to chime in with their, I mean, there are a bunch in the chat, but folks feel free. We have 10 minutes, um, you can, 
use your mic to ask, ask your question. Um, let me see here. So uh, I'm going to go backwards here. So a lot of people were asking about visual arts uh, and if you could address visual arts uh, okay. strategies. Yes, visual arts. Um, I didn't have write with me some visual arts pieces to put in my in my slides, which is why I didn't I didn't put them there. But it certainly doesn't mean that I haven't had lots of considerations for digital arts. Um, first of all, I think that most aspects of digital arts can be taught very effect uh, visual arts can be taught very effectively digitally. Um, Betty Wild Biasini is our um, visual arts professor who has been doing extensive work digitally. She teaches digital painting and she's found a wide range of ways to um, effectively teach the various aspects, whether it's intro to drawing or whether it's something more advanced um, in a digital environment. I do have from her an excellent little resource on getting started and thinking through the things that you need to do to teach your a visual arts class online. So if you have, if you would like that sp specific resource, please email me and I will send it to you. Now, I personally take a lot of arts classes. Uh, I, you know, I take painting classes face to face. <laughs> um, I take a number of um, digital visual arts that have been very, very successful. I really enjoy that modality. At first, I thought I would not, but I do. And there are ways that you can teach the visual arts, particularly drawing. Um, it might be a little bit more challenging to do painting, um, but people are doing this uh, virtually. Um, but the one thing is really find the tool that works for you in terms of um, presenting. Zoom is an excellent tool for sharing the courses I've taken that have been the most successful in the arts have been the ones in Zoom um, because of the presentation platform lends itself very well um, to the arts. And even though we use Microsoft Teams um, at uh, Empire State College now for our usual interactions virtually, we have, a num we have something called creative expressions where we do live virtual arts and performances, both visual performing and written using Zoom. It is an incredible platform for that sharing. Um, what you'll want to do if you're teaching drawing or if you're teaching um, you know, illustration or anything in which you have to see the student and they have to see what they're doing. I mean, of course, they'll have to have a camera. Of course, the camera will have to be on you. There are a number of tools that capture exactly the steps that you're doing. If you happen to use an iPad, with an Apple Pencil, the iPad Pro with the Apple Pencil are incredible tools. And Procreate is an incredible tool for teaching and doing drawing. If everything that you, that you draw is automatically recorded um, and you can um, share that with the students if you want to be showing them step-by-step step what happens without even have to worry about recording step-by-step step because it'll automatically be recorded if you have that setting put on. You can do, you can do the drawing, you can do the painting. Um, in, these, in these apps using these tools. Now there are a wide range of other tools. Some people learned with the Wacom long before the Procreate was available on the iPad. So they don't use iPads and, and Apple Pencil, which are phenomenal tools for artists. Um, but instead they use the Wacom, they use um, the stylus that goes with the Wacom, they use other tools, um, at, especially if they were working primarily with PCs, they may, they may have their preferred tool that they use. So there are a wide range of tools that you can get in which whatever you do digitally, drawing, et cetera, can be shared. Of course, you can go old school where you do it on paper and then you take a photograph with your iPhone or with whatever you want to use and then you share it. Um, and there are ways in which you can use these little kits that I have mentioned and you have one where the camera is on you as you're drawing and you set up maybe a couple of, of, of cameras and a couple of camera angles so that you can do that. So there are lots of ways that you can um, teach drawing online and we do it regularly. We have a ton of students that take intro to drawing, advanced drawing, illustration, watercolor painting and, and so on, um, multi, you, know, um, you know, multimedia, et cetera, um, in either fully online or as independent studies or as study groups, virtual study groups. Um, and there are all kinds of tools that make this possible. And there are all kinds of techniques that make this possible as well. So if you've been worried about being effective in teaching the visual arts online, I think that you'll find that there are many ways that you can very effectively teach these. Um, I do think the challenge is that some folks, you know, have been used to really working within that traditional medium. And of course, things are lost, right? Uh, you know, 
um, I mean, if you're working on something that works with a the texture, then it's often very difficult to capture that texture. 3D is becoming easier to capture because now there are so many 3D tools available that allow you to replicate in 3D, to photograph in 3D, and so on. Um, but often the way we handle, let's say, students sharing their work is that they create their work, they show the steps of their work all the way, then they take the photograph of their work. And again, nowadays smartphones are very sophisticated cameras and take high resolution images. They share that with the faculty member, um, either in real time or asynchronously. And that allows for uh, you know, a continuous um, opportunity to continue to learn these things online. Now, um, you also have the option, and this is one thing that is done, is that if the thing, the um, outcome, the artwork, is something that really needs to be seen in person as well, and that you feel that the digital is insufficient, then you can require that the student ship or mail their work to you. And that is also a practice that we have. So I'll stop there on that and, um, and take further questions. So um, there's a lot of questions about the affordability of technology and um, you know, looking for low cost solutions. You've talked a little bit about this. I mean, um, there are a lot of folks are talking and we've heard this a lot this week about, you know, the fact that some campuses will use, let you use Zoom and you have to just collaborate. And I think, you know, having to be flexible with that, those tools, you know, is important. Um, but one, one person, you know, and I think we talked about this in the March sessions, Nicola, is, uh, you know, what about if you're doing 3D art, so sculpture, uh, those sort of things, <laughs> uh, you know, what, how, would you, how would you approach that? Okay, so I'll talk about two aspects of, of, of 3D sculpture first, and then we'll talk about the low cost solutions and the interoperability of working with different platforms. Um, I personally have had a couple of students work on major sculpture works, um, graduate students, and they were doing these for capstone projects. So these were pretty big high-end projects. The first one is, a, you know, she's a sculptor. That's what she does. Um, but she decided that she really wanted to learn how to create spaces for artists who work in traditional sculpture to share their work in 3D environments. So she actually learned how to replicate her in-place sculptures in a 3D setting using virtual immersive worlds. She did a fabulous job, it was amazing. The work that she did was wonderful. So she took that 3D artifact that was a, a physical artifact and she replicated it in 3D environments. But that's high end. There's a big learning curve for that. It's not what everybody wants to do. Now, the other student who is actually very, you know, not, I would say, um, you know, a, you know a, a sculptor and an artist, but not as high level digitally as the other um, first example, she did the 3D sculpture and she did, she found a way to do an immersive 3D just video of the sculpture that captured it from all ends and, um, and that way was able to share it. You know, all angles below, around, a whole surround. And those tools are, I mean, some of these come embedded with a smartphone and some of them are a simple app, most of them low cost. So this is probably a good time to just talk about cost. Many, many apps are available for free. Many tools are available through, you know, at either, if not for free, at a very low sub subscription cost that should not be, you know, out of range for students, especially if you then say, well, you know, you're not paying for a hundred dollar textbook in this course, but you will need to subscribe to a $40 subscription or something like that. Um, of course, ideally we want free for everything, but that is not the reality of what's out there. As I mentioned, for our digital art and design courses, we require students to subscribe to the Adobe Creative Suite for the semester in which they take those courses. Um, we have other courses which do require some sort of subscription to something. Um, I tend to get out of that by simply, I let my students choose whatever they want to use. So if they want to use something that requires a subscription, that's their choice. If they want to choose something else, that is also their choice. Now, you may not know this, but Autodesk, um, the company that provides the high-end 3D programs like um, 3ds Max and like Maya and all of the really advanced CAD tools, 
they make those freely available to students and faculty and they provide all the tutorials you need to learn them. So if your students want to work on those, they can do that. Um, it is, again, it's a learning curve. This is for more of the high end, but those of you who are asking about what do you do about tools that are, that are too expensive, um, they provide educational pricing, which is literally free. Now that same educational pricing for Autodesk Maya, go back a few years, it was $1,500 at educational pricing and they, per person. And they made the change, I think, as a strategy. They figured that if people vested at student and faculty level in this tool, then they would purchase it once they became a professional in the field. So there are lots of tools out there. Some of them um, have a low to high subscription cost. Some of them are absolutely free. Um, and I think that the key is that if you're going to be an artist and you know, teaching art digitally, then you're probably going to want to even yourself as a faculty member subscribe in a couple of the tools. Like if you, if you don't have the Adobe Creative Suite subscription, you might want to get that. Like I personally pay for my own. I always have that. Um, and I personally play for the Kitely world that I use and that I've, that I've developed and teach in. Um, and it, you know, Kitely is, is, a, is a virtual 3D immersive world, great for the arts. And it's a low barrier to entry in terms of cost. It's like $15 gives you four regions. Whereas if you know about Second Life, that is hundreds of dollars per month for one region. Um, so there are options, there are tools, um, and about interoperability, in other words, being able to move seamlessly. Ideally, you want to design your teaching so that whatever you're doing will work in any environment. Um, for example, since we went to remote in my, in my organization, we've had some stuff that was in Zoom, some stuff is in Skype, some stuff is in Microsoft Teams. We're now just moving classes to Microsoft Teams before they were in Blackboard Collaborate or in Zoom. So the key is um, make sure that whatever you design, unless you're teaching a course specifically about a tool, like the examples I gave earlier, make it tool and platform agnostic. Make it so it doesn't matter what tool they're using, what space you're in. Um, that will make all the difference in the world for you. And then if you start having problems with one tool, you'll be able to seamlessly move to the other. If one space isn't working for you, you and your students can move to another. So I would say that that's my strategy. I stay tool agnostic, except for when I'm teaching something that specifically requires an industry standard application. All right, so we need to transition. I want to thank you, Nicola, very much for this excellent and very informative session. Uh, I did put in the chat a link to the, the where the room for the 2 p.m. meeting it will be. And so um, if you'd like to, before you leave, uh, uh, capture the chat, uh, that will be made available uh, with the all the recordings in the suny.edu slash suny RTI website. Uh, there's a link in the chat to that as well. But if you'd like to save the chat, just click on the three dots. You could save it right now before we leave. You can get all the links, all the emails, all the discussion on your own computer. Um, we, it'll take a little while for the chat to go up just because we need to take out all identifying information, which is also why I don't think we're going to be sharing out emails collectively to everyone who's registered. I mean, we had 750 people register for this, for all these sessions. And so we don't want to just sort of share all those emails out to everybody. We don't want you getting spammed or anything like that. So, um, but like I said in the chat, I'm willing to organize uh, subgroups in Workplace. I do encourage you to uh, join the larger arts group as well. There aren't that many people in there and there aren't that many discussion threads so it might meet your needs as well. Uh, and again, once again, thank you, Nicola. And I'm going to end the recording. And hopefully I'll see every the session that I posted the link to is just a kind of wrap up session for the Remote Teaching Institute. Um, so if you're interested in that, just hop over there and I'll be going there as well. Thank you so much for facilitating, Chris. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. That for was any, so good. Thank you, everyone.